Questions, the Honourable Member for Carleton. The Prime Minister looked 37 million Canadians in the eye and said, quote, if anyone, including the former Attorney General, had issues with anything we might have, they might have experienced in this government or didn't feel that we were living up to the high standards we set for itself, it was her responsibility to come forward, it was their responsibility to come forward, and no one did. This week, the Prime Minister admitted that statement was false, that in fact his former Attorney General looked him in the eye and warned against him politically interfering in the SNC-Lavalin prosecution. Now that we know the Prime Minister stated this public falsehood, will he allow the Ethics Committee to investigate what others he might have told in this affair? Mm -hmm. The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, we agree that Canadians should be able to hear the truth of themselves, and that's exactly why the Prime Minister provided an unprecedented waiver. He waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence to satisfy the parameters that the Justice Committee put forward. Madam Speaker, we recognize that it's important that the Justice Committee and all committees be able to do their important work, mm -hmm. and that's why the members that represent the government on those committees make their own decisions. That's obviously not the approach of the Conservatives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Former PMO puppet master and best friend of the Prime Minister showed up before the Justice Committee and claimed that there was no conversation whatsoever about the inappropriateness of the Prime Minister's political interference in the SNC-Lavalin affair in September, in October, in November, and in December. Yet now we have 41 pages of journal entries, text messages, and audio recordings that show there was nothing but conversation about that political interference. It's documented. Given that the, the, this former PMO puppet master lied before the Justice Committee, will the, the, the Liberals allow the Ethics Committee to investigate what other falsehoods the government might have told? Mm. The Earl, uh, Earl, uh, Official House Leader. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, um, what's important to note is why this information that the member is referring to is in public is because the Prime Minister waives solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence. Madam Speaker, we recognize that Canadians should be able to hear the truth for themselves, and that's why Justice Committee meetings took place in public. We know for over five weeks, Justice Committee members asked for witnesses to appear. We know that witnesses appeared, they answered questions to ensure that Canadians could hear for themselves. This information was made public. Madam Speaker, if the Prime Minister had not waived solicitor client privilege, that would not be the case. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. The journal entries, text messages, and audio recordings show that there were at least 12 top government officials, including the Prime Minister himself, that interfered in the, in the criminal prosecution of SNC-Lavalin, yet only two have appeared. And their appearances were so disastrous that both of them have had to resign from their jobs. The remaining 10 have not been called upon to answer for the inter interference we know they engaged in as a result of the documented records proving it. Will the government allow the Ethics Committee to continue an investigation bringing them all forward. Thank you. The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, there is a redundancy to the questions, as is with the information being provided. But it's important to note why that information is being made public. That information is being made public because the Prime Minister acknowledges, recognizes that Canadians should get to hear the truth for themselves. And that's exactly why he waives solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence so that when witnesses appear at the Justice Committee, they would be able to answer and provide the truth to Canadians for Canadians to hear. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Madam Speaker, yesterday, the Liberal Party may have leaked information to the media with regard to the possible return of the former Attorney General. Madam Speaker, yesterday evening at 8.30 p.m., CBC corrected its article saying that these conditions were discussed even while she was minister. This changes the story entirely. Trudeau's list, well, they got involved in the spin to smear the former Attorney General. 
Why has the Prime Minister been so difficult on this matter? Don't. Madam Speaker, we know that the Conservatives continue to mix things. They don't want to take the time to listen to the testimony. We know that the members who sit on the Justice Committee heard from witnesses. They provided testimony, and now all the facts are public. And the facts are public because the Prime Minister waived solicitor-client privilege and cabinet confidence. Madam Speaker, this is the first time in the history of our country that the Prime Minister has done so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. This is not fair because there are people who sit on the Justice Committee who appeared two times, whereas the former Attorney General was only able to appear before the committee once. We all there's a stop in the time period where the waiver applies, and the former Attorney General cannot talk about her, tell her whole truth. She cannot tell the facts as she experienced them. Why, once again, is the government refuse, refusing the Ethics Committee to do its work so we can finally shed light on this uh, Liberal SNC-Lavalin scandal? The Honourable Government House Leader, Madam Speaker, this is not true. The members who sit on the Justice Committee, amongst themselves, they decided to hear from witnesses on this topic, and they said that, well, they established parameters for the discussion. They wanted to make sure that the witnesses could appear and answer questions. The Prime Minister waived solicitor-client privilege and cabinet confidence to satisfy the parameters established by the members on the committee. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belay chambly Madam Speaker, yesterday the member from Mark Stovall, well, despite what they're saying, the, it's the very independency of our judiciary that's at the heart of this matter. She said, I chose to tell the truth. I chose principles that are so important for the future of our country. It's more important than my political career. Can the Justice Minister reassure us that he won't get involved politically in this decision and he won't overturn the decision of the DPP uh, on behalf of this uh, rich company. Question. What I can tell you here is that the witnesses who appeared before the Justice Committee, the two uh, witnesses who did discuss this topic, took many stages to underscore that the prosecution is unfolding as it should. M Madame, uh, the member from Vancouver Grenville went to great lengths to underscore that in this case and in all cases, the institutions are doing what, they're sh what they should and the rule of law remains intact. The Honourable Member for North Island, Powell River. Mr. Speaker, this week, dozens of women participating in the Daughters of the Vote stood up and turned their back on the Prime Minister of Canada for his treatment of two former female ministers. It's about a giant corporation with special access asking for special favours. It's about the Prime Minister and his office interfering with the work of the independent Attorney General. Will the Liberals lodge a public inquiry so Canadians can learn the truth and commit to not using the DPA in this case? The RO Minister of International Development and Status of Women and Gender Equality. Madam Speaker, 338 young women representing the diversity of this country, representing a diverse range of perspectives, took their seats in the House of Commons because our government invested in a partnership to bring them to this place, because they belong here, because our country will be stronger when we create spaces for perspectives. We are proud of their courage and their determination. They spoke about issues like climate change. They spoke about the need to advance gender equality. They want to make sure that they could get paid equally for work of equal value. And everything that we've been doing since day one has been to ensure that they are equal in every way. The R member for North Island Power River. Madam Speaker, I certainly hope that the Liberal government is not taking credit for the important work of Equal Voice. Yes, yes. Highways on most of North Vancouver Island, much like the rest of rural Canada, don't have cell service. Duncan Moffat spent seven days trapped in his truck after it went off the road north of Campbell River, wow. surviving off 
apples and Gatorade. He had a cell phone right next to him, but was unable to call for help. This rural highway sees over 4,000 vehicles a day. Lives are on the line. When will the minister commit to supporting cellular access on Canada's rural highways? Yeah. The Honourable um, Minister of Rural Economic Development. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question. Uh, we understand the need for better connectivity in rural Canada. We, we've invested a great deal of money in Budget 2019 to make sure that we meet those commitments. Our Connect to Innovate program has connected over 900 communities across the country. We'll continue to work hard to make sure that rural Canada is not left behind and that we do connect all of these communities so that we can address concerns that we've heard all across the country. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Despite nice words, it's government action and poor management on behalf of the Liberals that has, have deprived many families and companies from high-speed internet access. In my riding, 25 minutes from Montreal, there are still municipalities that don't have access to this service. We've been asking for a pan-Canadian strategy for quite some time to increase internet access in our communities. The Liberal government must show leadership on this file and listen to its municipalities. When will the Liberals truly support high-speed internet access in our regions? The Honourable Minister for Rural Development. Speaker, we've invested in Budget 2019 to make sure that we connect every Canadian in this country as well as businesses by the year 2030. Mm -hmm. We're looking at making sure that connectivity is available in all rural communities. We know that how important it is for people to grow businesses, to access uh, uh, education, to access health care. We know that Internet is a critical part of the rural Canadian piece, and we're making sure that we deliver on that promise. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Lakeland. Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister told Canadians no one ever raised concerns about his interference in the SNC-Lavalin prosecution, but all the evidence shows that's just not true. The Prime Minister only allowed the former Attorney General to speak about what happened before January 14th, the date he moved her out of that role after she had told him to back off repeatedly. But she said they had a series of meetings after that, which led to her resignation. And the Liberals themselves keep leaking information that they won't let her talk about, even as of yesterday. When will the Liberals take responsibility and the cover-up and tell Canadians the truth? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, what's clear is that that member, as well as the Conservative Party, have come to their own conclusions. And the reason why they're able to actually speak about this information is because all of the facts are on the table, Madam Speaker. All of the facts are now public because the Prime Minister waives solicitor kind privilege as well as cabinet confidence. Madam Speaker, this is the first time in the history of our country that this has happened. I have answered this question on numerous occasions. But what is clear is that the Conservatives will do whatever they can so that they don't have to talk about the budget. They will do whatever they can so that Canadians don't notice that they have no plan. But it's clear that the Conservatives have no plan, no plan for the economy, no plan for the environment. Honourable Member for Lakeland. Wave all of the restrictions. And they say the Justice Committee did its work on the PM's interference in the criminal prosecution, but on February 13th, the Liberals shut down that investigation. On March 26th, the Liberals stopped the Ethics Committee from holding any hearings at all. The Liberals say Canadians can have faith in the rule of law, but OECD anti-bribery officials are, quote, concerned and are, quote, closely monitoring Canada because of the Liberals' actions. The Prime Minister has contradicted himself many times. No one can believe a word he says. When will they end the cover-up and tell Canadians the truth? The Honourable uh, Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, when they, the Justice Committee met for five weeks in which they actually had witnesses appear, witnesses appear and they provide testimony. All of this information is on the public record. Madam Speaker, for five weeks, five weeks is more than any piece of legislation even is studied or scrutinized at committee. And what's interesting is at committee, there was numerous people that were able to appear. But when it came to our budget that we've just introduced that's going to help Canadians from coast to coast to coast, only one Conservative was allowed to speak. It was a member for Carleton, and all of a sudden the Conservatives forgot about rural Canada then. The Honourable Member for Megantic Clarable. According, the Liberals are going to do everything they can to not talk about SNC-Lavalin. Apparently, according to PM, everything has already been said on this affair. However, over the past few days, we've had new anonymous Liberal sources that have made uh, information public that we haven't seen anywhere else. 
And we have to wonder why, because the Prime Minister chose who would talk at the Justice Committee and what they would say. When will the PM finally allow the Ethics Committee to shed full light on his own scandal? The Honourable Government House Leader. On the contrary, Madam Speaker, I said that that I would answer every question because the Conservatives keep on asking the same question. For several weeks now, this has been the case, and the members who sit on the Justice Committee looked at this file for five weeks. Witnesses came, they provided testimony. So we talked about this topic, and we know that the Canadians have to hear the truth for themselves, and that's exactly why the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege and cabinet confidence. But it's clear that the Conservatives don't want to listen or talk about the budgets that's going to help Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Mégantic Lérable. Yes, the Prime Minister is judge of a case in which he's involved, and he also imposed the sentence on this case. He's judge, jury, and executioner, Ma Madam Speaker. There's new evidence appearing every day where the former AG can't even talk about uh, things we are here hearing in the press. So. The PM's masquerade has gone on long enough. Why don't the Liberals let the Ethics Committee investigate so we can hear the full story? The Honourable Government House Leaders, Madam Speaker, Canadians have heard the whole story because all these facts are now public. And this is the case because the, pri the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege and cabinet confidence. Every day, they want to ask for a, an emergency debate on canola. But during question period, they're not asking any questions on canola. They never asked a question about this. And they say they're close to these people. Order. The honorable member for Megantic Lahab was able to ask two questions. And now he has to listen to the answer to his questions. Green Nose Hill. You know, I remember, Madam Speaker, at the start of the SNC Lavalin uh, scandal when the Prime Minister had this press conference and he said, no, there's nothing more to see. It's all good. Then we had all of this testimony where all the evidence started to come out. And we've got the same situation here. You've got the government house leader doing his beck and call, standing up saying, nope, no more, nothing to see here. Yet the former Attorney General is still under a gag order and they are still blocking the Ethics Committee from doing their work. Why? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam President, I have to say that I'm quite confident being able to share the information and to share the facts. And Madam President, Madam Speaker, the information is all public because the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence. Madam Speaker, to ensure that people could share their stories, that they were able to appear, that's exactly why the Prime Minister provided an unprecedented waiver. Madam Speaker, that member might be concerned about me having to answer questions. I have the confidence and the ability to do so. I am okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The our member for Calgary knows you. Madam Speaker, I think at some point in time, the government House Leader might find herself clipped after whatever next tape is going to come out or whatever the PMO staff is going to leak to the media this week. That's what's happened. The PMO is leaking information for uh, a time period that the former Attorney General is still under a gag order for, and she's standing up here saying, yeah, it's all good, don't worry. It's ridiculous. That's like an abrogation of democracy. Why won't the PMO let the Ethics Committee do its work? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, that member and the Conservatives will talk about hypotheticals. We will talk about facts. We will talk about the fact that with our plan, 300,000 children have been lifted out of poverty. We will talk about the fact that over 800,000 Canadians are better off today than they were under Stephen Harper and the Conservatives. We will talk about the fact that Canadians have created over 900,000 jobs. Madam Speaker, we will talk about the fact that more Canadians are working today than have in my lifetime. Madam Speaker, the Conservatives will continue to talk about hypotheticals. They will continue to play and do their shenanigans because they have no plan and no concern for Canadians. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahat Langford. Madam Speaker, climate change is having a devastating impact on our rivers and watersheds. In my riding, water levels in the Cowichan River are at a fraction of what they should be and last year's salmon spawning season could be lost as many areas with eggs are now above water. This Liberal government easily found $4.5 billion for a pipeline 
So will the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans make the necessary federal infrastructure investments to raise the Cowichan Weir and ensure the survival of this critical salmon-supporting watershed? Absolutely. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my honourable colleague uh, for, for that question. Uh, the, the state of the salmon stocks uh, in British Columbia is of uh, great concern to this government. That's the reason why we created uh, the, uh, the, the BC Salmon Fund, uh, which was recently <laughs> announced. Uh, that fund will allow for us to work with stakeholders, to work with harvesters, to work with environmental groups to find innovative solutions. That is but one example of the, of the many steps that are being taken, all based on science, all based on consultation with Indigenous partners and with stakeholders uh, in, the, in the community. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our member for Timmins, James Bay. Madam Speaker, Canadians were shocked by the horrific conditions facing families in Cat Lake, and this community was desperate for help with the the mold and housing crisis. The recent agreement with the government is a new beginning, and yet we're hearing reports that an outside consultant is attempting to force the community to pay $1.2 million. This is money that should be spent on housing and improving the lives of the people. So will the minister explain the steps this government will take to ensure that those funds go to help the people and not to make some outside consultant a millionaire? We're here. The Honourable uh, Minister uh, of Indigenous thank Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Our work has always been focused on supporting the people of Cat Lake. Housing money will go to housing. It's as simple as that. Housing money goes to housing. Uh, it's why we signed an agreement with the community and with Windigo First Nations uh, and no one else. And reports that are coming out now of practices by consultants that other First Nations leaders, but also the Chief of Cat Lake, are calling parasitic and atrocious are deeply troubling to us, and we will be following through. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Levy Lobinière. Madam Speaker, the Liberal government is taking the leaked information on the appointment of Supreme Court judges very lightly. We all have the duty to protect the privacy of the appointment process and hold it dear to our hearts. The government is playing a dangerous game here and is flouting our judiciary and democracy. Madam Speaker, the person who is leaked this information is part of a very restricted circle of people. Who is it? The Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, we're very concerned by the leaked leak of information regarding the nomination of judges to the Supreme Court of Canada. The appointment process is solid. It's based on merit and guarantees that our most imminent jurists are screened from a restricted list. I'd like to repeat that Canadians should have trust, full trust, in the administration of justice. Thank you. Sturgeon River Parkland. Madam Speaker, when news broke of the Liberals' $10 million payout to a terrorist, they launched a massive investigation. But when sensitive information is leaked about Judge Glenn Joyal to distract from the SNC scandal, nothing. This information could have only come from the highest levels of the PMO. That's right. Now, the Minister of Justice says he's deeply troubled, but he refuses to launch an investigation. Is that because he already knows the answer? And if so, who did it? Here. That's right. Good question. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I'll add to the response I just gave in French, but we want to underscore that the integrity of the very process we are talking about depends on the confidentiality of all parties involved. As we have said, we are troubled by the publication of personal details about the Supreme Court justice selection process. It is unfair for any of the parties involved to see their names used this way in the media, and it is wrong, absolutely wrong, to weaponize personal information for political purposes. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Well, Mr. Speaker, when their $10.5 million payout to a convicted terrorist was leaked, the Liberals immediately launched an investigation that spanned six departments and agencies. But when another leak smearing a judge came out, the new okay. Attorney General just put out a tweet. This leak was obviously another damage control exercise to spin the former Attorney General's resignation and generate Liberal backbench support for her eventual caucus expulsion. So will the Attorney General investigate this leak? 
or is he too afraid of where it will end? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Attorney General, uh, Justice and the Attorney General. Madam Speaker, we are underscored that Canadians should have complete confidence in the administration of justice and complete confidence in the selection process that is used for Supreme Court justices. It is merit-based and it considers Canada's finest jurists for the short list. We have gone to great pains to ensure that the, for, the Honourable Kim Campbell leads up that selection process. We have ensured the bilingualism of Canadian judges. What we will always do is defend that institution and its important role in our democracy and in upholding the rule of law. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Madam Speaker, the Liberals launched a massive investigation into six different departments to find the source of the shameful payout to a convicted terrorist. But when confidential information about an Honourable Judge is leaked, no big deal. This is a highly sensitive information that only a handful of people close to the Prime Minister could have known. Why are the Liberals more concerned about protecting the privacy of a convicted terrorist than a judge who spent his entire life serving Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. Madam Speaker, as I have in, indicated, our office the Department of Justice is deeply troubled by the publication of personal details concerning the recent selection process. What we can state is what has already been stated. The Prime Minister stated that the leak did not come from his office, and the Minister of Justice understands that the leak did not come from the Justice Minister's office either. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Are major contributors to our rural communities and to our national economy. It is unacceptable that they are forced to pay the price for Canada's strained relationship with China. The ban of canola imposed by China is hurting Western Canada, and Liberals don't seem to get the urgency of stepping up to fix it. Our producers deserve better. Will the Prime Minister's office send a trade envoy to China to solve the canola seed ban face to face? Yes. Or no. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. Madam Speaker, I can assure my colleague this is a top priority for our government and for me since more than one month now. I'm working closely with my counterparts from the provinces, with the industry, with the CFIA. We are having constant conversation with the Chinese official. I have asked for a delegation to go to China, and I expect an answer shortly. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, I can assure you that we are taking this very seriously, and we have the support of the industry. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Madam Speaker, this week CMHC unveiled their new strategic plan at the 51st Annual Canadian Housing and Renewal Association's National Congress. The CEO of the Canadian Lions Stand Homelessness said the plan has a critical gap. It does nothing to embed the right to housing. Canadians can't wait any longer for Liberal talk to turn to action. We have a housing crisis and the Liberals refuse to solve it. When will they join the NDP and housing experts and finally enshrine the right to housing in law? The Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. The mandate is about growing the economy and growing the middle class and helping more Canadians join the middle class, and that comes with important actions and investments in housing to make sure every Canadian has a safe and affordable place to call home. We have renewed, in fact, we have launched the first ever national housing strategy, a new era for partnership and leadership in Canada, and that comes with the right for every Canadian to be housed decently and appropriately. The Honourable Member for Egmont. Madam Speaker, after a decade of the Harper Conservatives ignoring their needs in favour of boutique tax credits that only benefited the wealthy, our government has introduced measures that ensures when lower income workers file their taxes, they will get to keep more of their hard-earned paychecks. Will the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development tell the House how the new Canada Workers' Benefit will provide real support to more than 2 million Canadians who are working hard to join the middle class? The Honourable Minister of Families. And thank you to the member for Egmont for his question. Giving every Canadian a real and fair chance to succeed is at the core of our mandate. And that's why we have introduced the Canada Child Benefit and the new Canada Workers Benefit, which is going to automatically enroll 
2 million low-income Canadians, giving them more income in their pockets for them to make ends meet. And that's why 75,000 of them will be lifted out of poverty, and that's why we're going to continue to work very hard to give all those Canadians working hard to join the middle class to help that they need and deserve. The Honourable Member for Durham. Madam Speaker, when Liberal interference into shipbuilding was revealed, the PMO put their top issues person on the case, Zita Astervas. She'd previously worked with Jerry Butts and Katie Telford in the office of Dalton McGuinty when code words were used to hide disclosure of documents in the gas plant scandal. Now Ms. Astervas is being questioned about code words used to prevent disclosure in the Mark Norman trial. Will the Defence Minister confirm to this House today whether code words were used with respect to the disclosure of documents in the Admiral Mark Norman affair? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, the prosecution in question that has been underscored here is being handled by the PPSC, which operates independently from the Department of Justice and the Office of the Attorney General. Counsel to the Attorney General is fulfilling all of its obligations before the court with respect to the ongoing third party records application. It is absolutely improper to comment further on this issue as the matter is before the courts. The member opposite knows this as a lawyer, and we will not do, despite his pleadings, intervene in a matter and intervene and fetter the discretion of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. The Honourable Member for Durham. Madam Speaker, when Jerry Butts was the Principal Secretary to Dalton McGuinty, code words were used to d avoid disclosure of gas plant documents. When Jerry Butts became Principal Secretary to this Prime Minister, we now know code words were used to deprive Mark Norman of documents he needs to defend himself. Can the Defence Minister handle this truth? What was the code word used for the setup of Mark Norman? Yeah. Or, Madam Speaker, did he order the code red on Mark Norman? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, let me, let me explain this in crystal clear words. The reason why we observe the sub judice Convention is because currently, in this proceeding, in the Ontario Court of Justice, a judge is deliberating about the records that the member has just raised. We do not want to actually influence or to be seen to be influencing that judge in their deliberations, because that would be improper, improper for members of the government, improper for any members of this House. The Honourable Member knows this, knows this, as did his colleague, Mr. Peter Van Loan, who said this specifically, that members are expected to refrain from discussing such matters. That was the Honourable Peter Van Loan. I perhaps urge the member opposite to listen to his former colleague. Oh. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Saint Charles. Madam mm -hmm. Speaker, the Liberals claim they want to protect jobs in Quebec. They say everything they did in connection with SNC Lavalin was for that reason. But what we do know is that the only job the Prime Minister was trying to protect was his own. And in 2015, when they took office, they did everything they could to prevent Davy shipyards from building the asterisk and providing work for a thousand workers. Why did the Prime Minister want to cancel the contract? Mr. Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Ma Madam Speaker, the issue of this matter in respect to the important uh, issue of Vice Admiral Norman is before the courts, the Ontario Court of Justice presently is deliberating on this very issue. We have an opposition day motion. We now have opposition questions. They're opposing questions that relate to that court process. The reason why it is improper for both the questions and the responses to touch on that matter is because it could improperly either influence or be seen to influence that judge in their deliberations. We take the judge's role seriously, as should all members of this House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute saint charles Madam Speaker, unfortunately, my colleague didn't listen to the question. It had nothing to do with Admiral Norman. Madam Speaker, in 2015, the Royal Canadian Navy needed a supply ship, and Davy ship shipyards had the perfect solution. The Conservative Party approved construction of the Asterix. But the day after the election, the Prime Minister and his entourage did everything in their power to axe the project. When we heard the Liberals were scheming to halt construction of the Asterix, we pushed back and forced them to sign the contract. But now they want to punish the whistleblower. Why? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Public Services and Procurement and Accessibility. Madam Speaker, we are proud of having uh, 
had a, a ship built. That's something that never happened in the 10 years of Harper impoverishment of our forces. We're proud of the work of Davy Shipyard. They put their shoulder to the wheel to provide the Royal Canadian Navy with a supply ship that is the pride of Canada. We're proud of Davy Shiplip and we're proud of having given that contract to Davy Shipyard. Hey, Alberti. Madam Speaker, the federal court has ruled a DFO policy of not screening BC farm salmon for a lethal virus that has potential to infect Wild Chinook salmon is unlawful. Yeah. Justice Cicely Strickland ruled the federal policy unlawfully allows juvenile farmed Atlantic salmon to be transferred into open net pens without testing for the virus. Will the minister finally apply the precautionary approaches dictated by law and test for PRV before transferring farm fish to open net pens in our oceans? Will he listen to the courts and protect wild salmon? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my honourable colleague for that question. Uh, he, he, my honourable colleague would be well aware of the various measures that have been taken by this government uh, with respect to the, the, the protection and preservation of uh, wild salmon in, in British Columbia. Uh, we are well aware of this, uh, of this decision. Um, we are now uh, determining what the next steps are. But, but, the, the, this government is focused on the preservation of wild salmon stocks in BC. I just want to remind the members to allow uh, individuals to ask their questions and respond without being interrupted. The Honourable Member for Courtney Alberney. The government is failing to protect our waterways. According to a new survey released today, 9 of 10 people are worried about the impact of plastic waste on the environment. And 82% believe that the Liberals should be doing more to tackle it. New Democrats passed a unanimous motion on ocean plastics and we announced that we would ban single-use plastics by 20 2021. While the Liberals are still talking about a national strategy, the EU and India are already taking action to ban single-use plastics. So when are the Liberals going to take plastic pollution seriously and take real action? Our Minister of Environment and Climate Change. We're about to talk about what we're doing to tackle plastics, plastic pollution. We know we've got a real problem. If we don't tackle plastic pollution, we will have more plastics by weight than fish. We've banned microbeads. In the G7, we created the Oceans Plastics Charter where we have targets internationally. We are supporting developing countries so they have proper waste management systems. We are also ensuring that in government operations that we're eliminating unnecessary single-use plastics. We put suppliers on notice that we will be choosing suppliers that have innovative solutions. Um, and also, we're working with provinces and territories on our zero plastics waste strategy that will be announced in June. Excellent. The RL member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Madam Speaker, we know from the SNC scandal that this Prime Minister will politically interfere to protect his friends and stop at nothing to destroy anyone in his way. Vice Admiral Mark Norman has been waiting since October for this government to comply with court orders to provide documents from Gerald Butts, Michael Wernick, Katie Telford and Zita Astravas. But the Prime Minister and his staff think they are above the law. Will the Prime Minister immediately hand over all documents and ensure Mark Norman gets a fair trial. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, as I've already said in response to the member from Durham, and I'll repeat it again, this very matter that has been underscored by the member opposite is currently before the courts. It's important to let that court process unfold. She cited an application that has been made for third-party records. That's exactly what's transpired. The Ontario Court of Justice is deliberating on that application. Justice lawyers and, and, uh, and counsel for Mr. Norman are participating in that process. We will not comment on that process because it is improper to do so. We will not interfere politically in a prosecution under the auspices of the Conservative Party's urgings. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Madam Speaker, this is not about commenting on a trial. It's about complying with the law to provide the necessary evidence. Mm -hmm. After relentless stonewalling, a 60-page memo from the former Clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, was finally delivered to Norman's lawyers. But it was unreadable, completely blacked out. Canadians should be worried. If the Prime Minister can prevent a distinguished Admiral from getting a fair trial, no one is safe. 
Will the Prime Minister immediately hand all mm -hmm. documents with nothing blacked out? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I'll confess absolute incredulity, Madam Speaker, to that question. Trial fairness is pivotal. Agreed. Trial fairness is pivotal. The notion that we should intervene politically and dictate to an independent prosecution service what should be disclosed is called intervening in that trial. That renders null and void the trial fairness that the member opposite is seeking to uphold. That is not what we will do. That is not what any government or any parliamentarian should seek to do in this process or any other process. The Honourable Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Penbrook. Madam Speaker, when news broke of a secret $10.5 million payment to a self-confessed convicted terrorist, the government it launched a, a, an investigation spanning six departments to find out who blew the cover-up. When news broke of the Prime Minister trying to interfere in the prosecution of a liberal-friendly, well-connected corporation uh, charged with uh, corruption, he, uh, in turn, slammed down the, the Justice Committee to keep it a secret. When the Liberals cut the shipping order, uh, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Madam Speaker, I'm going to anticipate where that question was going, and I believe it was going towards the issue of the Supreme Court appointments process. And what I would say is what I've already said on the record, and that is that we take any disclosure of personal and, and confidential information very seriously. It is very troubling. Secondly, I would reiterate for Canadians that are watching that we've, they should have at most, utmost confidence in the process we are using to uphold the administration of justice and the rule of law and to ensure that the people who are selected for that high office are merit-based and are fully eminent and capable of fulfilling the high office and, and its important function in protecting the rule of law in this country. The Honourable Member for Ottawa West Nepean. Madam Speaker, sport is fundamental to bringing together a community. All across Canada, we have children involved in recreational sports. And every one of them should always feel free to play, coach, or participate freely in sport safely. From her very first day, the Minister of Science and Sport committed to ending abuse, harassment and discrimination at all levels and for all ages in sport. Can the Minister please update this House on the historic measures that she announced last week? Thank you. The Honourable um, Minister of Science, uh, sorry, I'm... Everything. Uh, of Science and Sports, yes. Uh, thank you to my Honourable Colleague for an important question. The safety of our athletes is our top priority. That's why we've announced two new initiatives, an independent third-party investigative unit and a national toll-free confidential health line to address abuse, discrimination, harassment. This builds on our previous work, including putting in place tough new measures uh, for our national sports organization, signing a declaration with every province and territory on safe sport, and creating a universal code of conduct. We must end abuse yes. in sport. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. The scandal has shown Canadians exactly what this Prime Minister thinks of people who speak out against corruption and wrongdoing. He fires them. Okay. The new Treasury Board President was at our committee for our unanimous report to update legislation that protects whistleblowers a report the Liberal government promptly threw in the garbage wow. instead. Will she commit now to implementing the recommendations made by the committee and protect Canada's whistleblowers? Good question. Good question. The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Public Services and Procurement and Accessibility. Well, as you know, uh, Madam Speaker, the previous Conservative government ignored for years the legislative requirement to review the Public Service Disclosure Protection Act. Right. Our government did the right thing and I requested that the, the committee of which the member speaks undertake a review and we have, of course appreciate the committee and its work and it contained useful recommendations to improve the whistleblowing regime in the federal public sector. We agree improvements are required. We are taking concrete steps to strengthen the regime to ensure whistleblowers that they have the protections they deserve, unlike Mr. Harper's government. Among them improved guidance, increased awareness activities and training. John Zeist. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The International Energy Agency notes that since 2000, energy efficiency in major economies has actually offset one-third of the rise of energy-intensive activities like heating buildings, industrial processes, and transportation. 
Since most of our energy still comes from greenhouse gas sources, energy efficiency can help us meet our climate change goals while saving money, supporting competitiveness, and creating jobs. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources please explain how Budget 2019 will promote energy efficiency and help Canada meet our climate change commitments? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary uh, to the Minister of... Natural resources. Natural resources. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the member for St. John's East for the question and his hard work on the Committee of Natural Resources. Our government is making it easier for Canadians to lower their energy bills while tackling climate change. Through Budget 2019, we are investing over $1 billion to increase energy efficiency at home, at work, and in our communities. Not only do these investments reduce emissions, they also create good, well-paying, middle-class jobs. While Conservatives in Ontario are cutting energy efficiency programs, hurting families and businesses in the province, we are delivering for our commitment on, in, our, in our economy. Thank you, Madam. Bravo. The Honourable Member for Barry Innisfil. For weeks now, the Prime Minister has said the reason he politically interfered with the independence of our judicial system is because of potential job losses at SNC-Lavalin in cities and towns across Canada. One of those towns is Port Elgin, Ontario, near the Bruce Nuclear Facility. People in Port Elgin say they're baffled by the Prime Minister's comments. Even the Mayor said what we do know locally is that snc -Lavalin Lavalin is planning an expansion. Why can't the Prime Minister just admit this wasn't about job losses, it was a pure political play, and it was corruption at the highest office of the land? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, first of all, information is all public because the Prime Minister waived solicitor client privilege as well as cabinet confidence. And it also confirms that the Justice Committee did its important work to ensure that Canadians would be able to access this important information. What the member has actually just confirmed is that when it comes to these jobs that they are throughout the entire country. This is a Canadian company and we have to make sure as a government that we always defend our economy, that we defend Canadian jobs. It's unfortunate that that member doesn't recognize that and it's probably why the Conservatives had such an abysmal record under 10 years of Stephen Harper. Thank you Mr. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne. Madam Speaker, the revenue minister can't be counted on. The noose was supposed to be tightening around the necks of tax cheats in the Panama Papers. Not so. The minister was supposed to have hired 1,300 new international tax inspectors. Didn't happen. She was also supposed to have recovered $25 billion worth of unpaid taxes in the tax havens. That didn't happen either. Since she can't be counted on, will she at least turn the data over to the Parliamentary Budget Officer so that he can expose the full extent of the government's complacency? The Honourable Minister of National Revenue. Revenue National. Madame la Pre Madam Speaker, the figures speak for themselves. The agency hired 1,300 auditors between January 1st, 2016 and January 1st, 2019. That's the figure I was referring to. We've made historic investments of over a billion dollars at CRA so that the agency is better equipped to fight tax evasion. Without those investments, the number of auditors would have dropped and the number of tax cheats would have increased. The noose is tightening. The Honourable Member for Taiwan. Madam Speaker, a U.S. company, Aqua Bounty, has begun producing industrial quantities of genetically modified salmon in PEI. Not keen on giant-sized laboratory salmon boosting corporate profits? Well, we don't want them on our plates either, but too bad, you're going to have to eat it anyway. It won't be labeled. What's it going to take for the federal government to get it? Quebecers want to know what they're eating. When are they going to do like most industrialized countries and require GMO labeling? Chair to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam Speaker. All the rules were followed. There are very specific rules put out by Health Canada and the CFIA, and all the rules were fully complied with all along the way. The Honourable Member for Terrebonne, Madam Speaker, 
Every year, businesses worry in Quebec about the delayed arrival of the temporary foreign workers they need. Those businesses pay thousands of dollars to Service Canada to have their applications processed promptly, but at the other end, they're asleep at the switch. Again today, businesses have lost contracts because workers who were supposed to be on the job Monday have not yet arrived. Those applications have still not been processed. The endless bureaucracy in Ottawa is jeopardizing businesses in Quebec. What's the minister going to do, not tomorrow, but today, to ensure the temporary foreign workers arrive on time? Of employment, workforce, and uh, labor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And certainly the uh, record numbers of jobs grown by this government uh, since coming to power has had an impact across this country, and specifically in, uh, in, in Quebec. Uh, we recognize that. I have an interesting uh, read on my night table, Madam Speaker. Uh, uh, right here, right now, a book by uh, the former Prime Minister uh, Stephen Harper, where he admits in the book that they really jigged up the temporary foreign worker pro uh, program, Madam Speaker. We're putting additional resources into the program. We're going to fix it. If we can, we're going to unjig it. The Honourable Minister, uh, uh, the Honourable Minister, the Honourable Member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last week in Ottawa, five people died of opioid overdoses, and every day across Canada, 11 lives are lost to opioid overdose. And the fastest growing population requiring hospital care from op requiring hospital care from opioid o overdoses are young Canadians aged 15 to 24. In my own writing, there are nearly 600 emergency department visits for opioid poisonings last year, which is a more than 30 percent increase over the previous year. And just last week, the town of Bracebridge is looking at declaring a state of emergency. When will this government start funding treatment to help addicts conquer their dependency on this terrible, life-destroying drug? The RO Minister. Uh, uh, Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for his question and his, for his concern about this issue. Our government is deeply concerned by the tragic impact of the opioid crisis, and our hearts are with all of those who've lost a loved one. This is the most significant public health issue in Canada's recent history. We've responded by investing over $350 million in emergency response, much of it in treatment, restoring harm reduction, and cutting red tape and removing barriers to treatment. This is a medical issue, not a moral one, and we will continue we to do all we can to save lives. Oh.